Scythe by Stonemeyer Games is a favorite by Jamie Stegmeyer's creations. This game here encapsulates all of the games that come after it from Stonemeyer Games, and we'll get into that in a second. But Scythe itself is basically, in my opinion, the godfather of all of those really popular games he's made, whether it be Tapestry or Euphoria, or, or I'm gonna even guess the newest one, Pendulum, and we'll take a look at that. And it even kind of encapsulates Wingspan in a bit as well. And you're going to notice certain things like these symbols that are used, the little meeple tokens that are introduced in each of the games after this one, the idea of area control and trying to gain victory points via these tracks that will score you points over a period of time, utilizing your objective, and also every single character is going to have a huge amount of customization, in fact more customization than most games you're used to. You're also going to see a very similar style of manufacturing with this game along with the other games in the Stonemaier Legacy. So I actually didn't play Scythe until after I played all of his other games, which is, I guess, kind of weird, right? So now when I think back on it, it's gonna be definitely a very different experience from those of you who started with Stonemaier from their inception and continued along with them as they've made new and designed different types of games. And what's interesting for me specifically is the fact that when I went back and played Scythe, after playing Euphoria and Tapestry and the uh, even my little scythe, right, as well as Wingspan, I started to go, wow, I'm seeing a lot of similarities in this game in comparison to those games. Like, there's a large different stylization with those games that are kind of like branch off from this granddaddy that is Scythe. And I don't know if you guys noticed it because I don't know how you guys have played in what order, or maybe you're just a little more inquisitive than I am and you were able to deduce that as you played the other games to see what type of stylization is brought forward from this game into those games. Now, I know this is supposed to be a review video and we will discuss the game of Scythe. I'll bring it down and we will talk about what you're going to do in this game and how it's going to function and what you're trying to do to play. But I'm gonna guess for most of you, you've already played this game, heard of it, seen a playthrough or understand the idea of it. What I kind of wanna get into depth depths with more about the type of game this is and how it has created the rest of the games in the genre, as well as all of the Stonemaier games, legacy games that have been produced throughout the ages and how Jamie has kind of taken certain parts and bits of this game that were very heavily popular and utilize them in other games to make them also heavily popular, which is why all of his games sell out over and over and over again because the main grand granddaddy, this guy here, Scythe, has been a very powerful game in that lineup and been able to show what works and what doesn't work and how you can put them together and make a really interesting and unique game come to life in many games, even with other designers. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and take this down below. I'm gonna kind of show you what comes in the game, an idea of how it is played because most of you probably already know, and then how it kind of correlates to other games so that you can get a sense of what games you might want to pick up in his lineup if you haven't played them already, and why you might want to pick them up, as well as is Scythe a really good game, or is it overhyped? Is it something that you've played before, or is it something new and very intriguing for you? I hear a whole bunch of things about this game. Some people are like, oh, it's overplayed, I've already blah 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 blah, and some people are like, this is the best game ever, and I think it's probably somewhere in the middle. And not just that though, what makes this game so unique actually, in my opinion, is the fact that it created a ton of different styles of games, as well as other designers saw the value of this game and started using some unique mechanics into their own games. And you'll notice them too. And I want you to let me know in the comments below, are there any games you think, modern board games that came after Scythe that have kind of utilized what Jamie has put into this game and kind of made it their own? I have a couple of my own ideas, but I'd like to see what you think down below in the comments. Regardless though, let's show you the board now. So here's the game Scythe, and most of you have probably seen this game set up or have played this game, so I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail as to how to set it up or how to play the game. I am gonna give you little basic pointers and what the game's conceptually like, but what I really wanna talk about is these games here, 
in combination with this game here and how this one has influenced these games. But before we do that, let's discuss some stuff here. This is the Board of Scythe, and in the base game, you've got the five different characters. All of the characters are going to have their own character boards, which are going to have each one of these babies here, and you're going to combine them. So you're always going to have a unique type of of, of player board because you're gonna have two different types, right? And some go with others and others don't go with others, but usually you're gonna get to change it up as you play the game. Not only that, but the board is an area control style game. You have your characters down around here and you're going to be trying to move along in this board and gather resources, build certain things, gain upgrades and all kinds of interesting things. But what's the most interesting thing about this game is actions. This is an action choosing or action selection game in which you'll be able to take one of four actions when you start the game. And in many of Jamie's games, in fact, you will get to select one of four actions. Like for instance, tapestry. Tapestry is going to be this big board here. And when you play this game, you'll be selecting one of the four actions around this board. Now, things happen and change based on these actions here, but when you select them, you're basically going to be moving along those tracks, and as you do, interesting things will occur. And the same is said for this one as well. When you select to do something like trade here, you can then also choose to pay to upgrade. And the actions that you select based on the board will be different based on choosing uh, which type you want to play or wh which one you want to play with. But everyone will get the same types, which is really interesting. And that function actually pushes through to games like Wingspan as well. Wingspan here has also four actions you can take. You can go ahead and take two gain food, play a bird, lay eggs, or draw bird cards. And when you do that, it's going to change as well. If you choose to simply play a bird card, that might be a basic action, but how about laying, uh, how about drawing bird cards? That influences all the birds you've played and changes the way it goes. And so does Scythe. Scythe is the granddaddy of doing that because as you upgrade and utilize your board in new ways, you're able to choose to do two different types of actions as opposed to maybe just one, as well as two sets for each of the actions you choose. If you want to go ahead and pay to bolster, maybe you're going to bolster three instead of two because you chose to upgrade. And so you can kind of formulate your own actions as you play, adding customization. And what's really nice about this game is this stuff fits in place. You're going to be able to set this game up very quickly after you play the first game. Playing this one time is all you need to know to understand how to play games like Wingspan, Tapestry, Euphoria, and of course, My Little Scythe, which is basically a smaller version of this game. But they all function like that, which is so great about this game and all the rest that go ahead and do the same thing, because you know where the pieces are going to go and how they're going to be placed. Now, some games do it well, better or worse than others, but specifically Stonemaier Games does an excellent job at this. You know what to place, and where to place it. Production is another really important and relevant aspect to these type of games, specifically Scythe. They are going to have little hearts that you're going to be utilizing on the board that's going to give you morality or whatever, and battle strength. There's certain, certain tokens that you're going to see utilized. And of course, stars. Stars is a very specific type of icon that you will see in pretty much all of these games here, except for probably Wingspan. Wingspan is probably the most different version, a different type of game in this lineup, specifically because it's not designed by Jamie. It's designed by Elizabeth Hardgrave, but you do see Jamie's elements in the game. And Stars is one of those things that you'll see in all the rest of these. And Stars actually usually refer to either some type of victory point or victory condition, specifically in My Little Scythe and Scythe itself you're going to actually use those stars to end the game hopefully in your favor. Whereas stars for something like uh, Tapestry or Euphoria might involve something slightly different but still maintain the same usefulness. And Euphoria functions very similarly as well. When you take the setup here for Euphoria, you will see the die, which is more of a worker placement game, but it also adds all these little stars here, which you're going to utilize as well. And it all stems from this game here, Scythe, which I really, really like the ingenuity. Now I'm quite, I'm curious for you guys. Do you think that it's more of a production thing where it's like, I'll just throw stars in every single game. That way it'll save me money. Or do you think there's a little bit more about why he chooses to use what he does? I think it has to do with branding. Whenever I think of a star, specifically a star that looks like that, I always think of Stonemaier games, and I always associate them with victory conditions or victory points. 
every single time. And I think it does a very, very good job of that because now it's ingrained in me with all of these games and any other game I play. And it makes me think that there's something wrong with those other games when they don't function the way this game is supposed to function. Another thing to note too, is the quality of components for all of the Stonemaier games stuff. Now, regardless of whether you choose to get something that's got like the deluxified versions, which I don't think any of my games are, or choose to just get the base game, which I think all of my games are, all of their stuff is extremely high quality. Scythe being uh, extremely high quality in and of itself, all of the tokens are very thick, very nice, all of the miniatures are very well detailed, and all of the tokens as well, and they're all symbolized to mean something, and it's fairly easy to understand what they mean as soon as you've played the game once. Another thing to note too as far as qu qu uh, production quality is of course the fact that the boards will usually have like cutouts if they need to, and if they don't need the cutouts it will just be extra thick surfacing, and when you have things to place into certain spots of the board, those pieces will go there each and every time, and it's going to facilitate your memory by placing those pieces down. I know that these are always going to go here now. I, I know how all of these actions will always function, and I'm going to really remember how they work because of the cho choosing of, because they chose to place those there and select who how to set up. Now, something else that's pretty interesting as well, as far as the quality goes, the components go, rule books. Now this is probably the most expansive and most complex rule book of all of the Stonemaier games in my opinion. And I've seen them advance as they've learned how to explain rules. And they do it a lot differently than other people do. Tapestry has basically two pages of rules, but is almost as complex as the game Scythe, if not pretty much the same, or you could be even potentially more, depending how how much you play, I suppose. But it's covered in only two pages, and the rest is references. So once you learn how to read the rules, which will take you about 15 to 20 minutes, which is when you watch something like a Watch It Played video, where they almost basically recite the rules word for word, no offense, in fact, that's probably what's best to do because it's so well done, but, the, it, it covers everything precisely. You understand it as basic as you need to. And when you have a question, there's a small reference and you can go ahead and look at that, which means you can get into the game very quickly. Scythe is the one that probably does that the least well because it has a lot of information to cover as for all of the different actions, but it still does that. And you see this transferred into all of these games. So as you've played more and more of the new Stone Meyer sets, you're going to start to realize the rules get more con conduced, can, 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 can squish, you know, when you squish them together and make them make sense really easily. And that's what this started, this trend of making rules short and concise, but still giving the game a lot of value and a lot of creativity as well. One other thing I want to talk about, which is pretty interesting in my opinion, which started with this game, and of course a ton of other board games do it, but maybe not all that much like these specific type of games, where of course you're going to get some type of card or cards at the end of the game where you're going to try and score points, and you'll be gaining them uh, in unique ways. So in this case it'll be like, if you have two canoes at the end of the game, you will score two victory points. Every one of these games does that in a unique way. And so when you go from one game to the next, it's going to have you, you're gonna know what those actions do, which is also really cool too, if you think about it, because if you get one game and then you go for the next one, they kind of link together, even as far as how victory points are chosen and how you're going to be gaining them, just like combat. These games, most of them, have some sort of combat. Yes, Wingspan doesn't, but Euphoria and Tapestry and, of course, Scythe all have combat. But the combat is different. It doesn't feel necessarily like combat. It feels more like gaining control or power, which is kind of what the game's going to have you try to do. It's a more strategic form. You're not simply rolling dice like a dungeon crawler. You roll the sixes and you just solidify the win. Most of the time in these games, losing combat necessarily doesn't mean it's going to cost you anything. It's just going to benefit the winner in some way. Winning combat in Scythe means you're gonna get a certain victory uh, token to place on the board, which will guarantee or potentially help you guarantee victory easier. Winning victory in tapestry as you move around the board will remove a character's token or piece off of the board and they might lose some points throughout the game, but they're not going to lose their position 
as far as how they're going to be building their engine, but you will gain something. And then Euphoria, where you're simply placing die down on the board, and when you place a die down on a board that has a piece that is already there, or a die that's already there, instead of like making them lose that piece or remove it from the game or something horrid like that, it just brings it back to that player and they can go ahead and replace it but you can still use that action and it feels the tension is there, the com competition is there, and you know that somebody is targeting you and you can go ahead and go back and forth with them. This one of course does the best job at actually simulating a, an actual combative experience because you are bidding on combat value versus your opponent's bidding and you can utilize not only those but combat cards, but it doesn't have that negative in my opinion, connotation as to how you're going to have somebody else suffer after the combat is over. It's a minor, it's a minor penalty, basically, for that player. They're going to lose out in some small way. It's overall going to benefit you and your spe specific condition, which is a really cool and unique thing about combat in the Stonemaier games. There's one final thing I want to touch on, and that has to do with theming for Stonemaier games. You're never playing as an individual character or an individual thing in these games. These are all about world building. You feel like you're part of maybe an ardent militia going up against the scary, dangerous, dangerous warlords, or maybe you're the outside nomadic tribes attempting to blast through the regime and go through these tunnels and find out your new location that you want to visit. Or perhaps you're playing as a flock of birds, and you're just trying to gather the best amount of birds possible to fit each of your topiaries. Or tapestry, maybe you are the isolationists, and your objective is not to fight, but to gather area, seclude yourself, and gain points in that way. And a ton of different other choices where you're trying to go for a world domination simulator without actually feeling combative when the game has combat in it. Interesting. Or Euphoria. This is a post-apocalyptic type futuresque game where you're playing in the clouds, but you're also working with those people that are digging underground. And of course, there's other different realms that you can deal with as well. And you're playing these die down. And as you do that, you are basically feeling like your workers are producing in the different factories and how they produce will benefit you in certain ways to make a better dystopian future. And then of course, uh, my little site where maybe you don't want the aggressive style combat, maybe you actually want to play as a little group of critters going around and gathering certain items and utilizing them. And when you get into trouble because other kids are trying to take your toys, throw some pies at them. So it still gives that idea of scythe without it having that combative aspect, even though the combat aspect doesn't necessarily feel like you're actually like hitting another person. It actually reduces that down and makes it easier to understand for you little kids to get involved. If you get your nine year old or 10 year old to play this game and understand it after a couple games, they can probably jump on scythe. That's how the rules are made for these games. What can I say that hasn't been said a hundred times before? What perspective can I give that's different for you to to pick up this game that somebody else hasn't like went out of their way to brutally examine this game. It's why I didn't really want to talk about Scythe specifically in this review because most people have played the game or know if they want to pick it up and the only people I'm really talking to are the fans that just haven't gotten it or you've never actually heard of any of these games before and this would be a video to explain why this line of games is so unique and interesting and innovative and vibrant and beautiful. Well, what I can say is simply that I played this game last. Of all the games other than I think Viticulture, I have played out of order, backwards. Except for Pendulum, I haven't played that one yet, but every other one has been backwards in order. And so I've got to experience their, the mechanics and the feel of these Stonemaier products in a weird way. Most people have played Scythe, and I know because a ton of people loved it when it came out, and then they went after that and played each and every one of these ones. They picked them up. If you're a collector of this style, if you're just watching this video to hear what I have to think because you already own all these games and you already have your own opinion, then really, you know, you're gonna have a very different view on Scythe than I do. Scythe has a lot of mechanics, and all of those mechanics share something with the rest of these games. And after playing Scythe, I got to feel all of those games in this one game, which was really cool. Now, one side of me says it's kind of stale. I go, oh, I've already seen how the tokens are worked and how you gain resources and push them along the track. It's similar in ways like not only My Little Scythe or Leaders of Euphoria um, or even Tapestry, but also I've seen how the combat is played from My, My Little Scythe, obviously. So that game does share a role. and. Understanding that game did give me a little bit of an understanding as to how to play this one a little quicker, right? But so the rules are very simple nonetheless. And I just felt like, yes, that could potentially make it feel a little stale. 
You know, you're like, oh, I've already played all these mechanics before in their own way. Uh, but of course, there is you know, little unique things about this game that aren't in the rest of the games. But there definitely is a ton of Stonemeyer in this product, obviously. Like, this is like the granddaddy that fits everything in. Whereas all the rest of them have unique little offshoots and they do different things that change the process up and change it to make it feel different. And so on one side, yes, that's one thing I thought. And the other side, I was like, you know what? Most of all the mechanics I liked from those games that are in this game, you know, it makes this game a congruent game, a congruent game of all the good mechanics from all the rest of the games. That's not to say that those other games didn't have unique and interesting and good mechanics. It's just those specific ones that I remembered mostly, those like more vibrant and like memory, like surging type of mechanics are in this one as well. Gathering the resources, moving up the trackers, utilizing your aggressive tactics without actually being extremely aggressive and gaining those position points. And position points are so important in all of these games, whether it be something like Wingspan where you're trying to gather all the specific types of, of food and control those as opposed to everybody else getting them. And that's why you'll select the double-sided food token as opposed to the single, which I'm not even going to get into, but that plays a role. Just like in Euphoria, where you're not going to always want to be combative because if you do that, you'll let your opponent roll again. That's really irritating. And sometimes fighting in this game too, it's going to give you that advantage. But now you've got that buffer zone that's gone because you won that combat. Now you've got two people to deal with. So it makes you make choices in that specific way, which is so great. So there's just these two combating thoughts in my head as I was playing. And then I thought, what did the other players in my game group think when they were playing this game? Because none of them had played it before. Oddly enough, I had some diverse perspective in the game from people I wasn't sure were going to like it, and I didn't know who would like the game more or less. And we had played Wingspan before. They had never played any Stonemaier games before, and they jumped into Wingspan, we explained it, they were not big board gamers, right? So I wanted to see which one of these games they would like more, which one is more of a gateway game. And obviously, in my opinion, and obviously Callie's opinion too, Wingspan definitely is one of those beginning gateway games. It's kind of seeing a new, it's turning a new leaf in gateway games. Could be the new style of gateway games, in fact, not only for theme and also mechanics, but in, in, in particular because of how they interact with each other and the informative aspect of that game, right? Did they like it after playing that one is my question though, because is it going to translate as well? It did. It oddly did. That game broke that mold. I mean, most people in my game group, especially new gamers, especially gateway gamers, whether they're male or female, are not gonna wanna play something like Twilight Imperium. They're not gonna wanna get into a heavy war game. They're not gonna wanna play a large area control game, which Scythe looks like it is, and kind of pushes people away just based on the style and how much stuff is in the game. You think you can do a whole bunch and there's way too many choices, but there's four. There's four in almost all of his games, which is so interesting to explain to people. They go, okay, what can I do? I'm like, we well, have four things you can do. And then when the game gets a little more, pro you progress a little more in the game, you get four things you can do, and then you can do the other four things separately. One, you know, so you'll get this, this action, and then this one, this one, and then this one. N but in general, you only have to worry about the first four at the beginning, and it ramps up, and they all were into it. In fact, most of them did way better than me. They were progressing through the game, understanding the best possible strategies and outcomes, gaining control of certain things like the middle of the board, faster and more articulate as to what they were uh, choosing and why they were choosing it. And I was just trying to go along and understand, make sure I wasn't giving them any poor information and I'm moving my character around to just do all the fun adventure stuff, which is also something you can do in the game. And they pushed through. They, they started doing the combat aspect of the game, which I wasn't expecting them to enjoy. And they also were doing the diplomacy aspects, the social pushing in the game. If you don't do this, I won't do this. And if I do that, you won't do that. And we go, yeah, of course. And then I lied. I am doing the thing I said I wasn't going to do, but now I am going to do. Which just makes me think, are all of these games in some way gateway games? Or do you think that most of them actually are different? Is Tapestry and Scythe and different values, like one medium light, one a medium game, and then maybe Wingspan is more on the gateway side? Or do they all kind of share something really individual? Which is kind of that I was delving into this entire video. Like, do they all share enough to where you can actually play throughout all of these different games and get a sense of them rather quickly, even though one is a worker placement, one is a puzzle type game, with action selection. This one is area control and action selection. And then wingspan, which is 
like resource gathering, tableau management, card placement, none of these games sound similar at all, but they're all extremely similar. And the takeaway from my group was they gathered certain things from the previous game to this one here, and they've learned, and they understood how they functioned. They liked different aspects of the cards that you can use at the end of the game, how combat functions. They enjoyed the beautiful aspect of the game. And I think that's wonderful. I really, really enjoy that. <laughs> it, it, just, it was just so interesting to see and so unique because I feel like in a lot of senses, people in general would see a game and they would be turned off from the scary aspect of it. Whereas with Wingspan, getting them to try something like that first and pushing them in through all the rest of these games, it, it kind of gives you that leverage. And I also think that if you're able to get somebody to go and take a look through Scythe and play the game Scythe, You'll then have that process, well, maybe you will. I have to wonder, right? you, can, you can tell me what you think, but do you think they would actually allow you to uh, play Tapestry and then Euphoria and Viticulture and My Little Scythe? Maybe not My Little Scythe. That one's probably a predecessor, but you get what I'm saying, right? So I don't know. I just really, really enjoyed my experience with it. It was, it was so different and unique playing with new players for the first time, trying a game that I had heard so much about. If you want my review of the game, it's great. I really enjoy most of the, the games that they have made. I haven't played all of them, so I can't say that indefinitely. And of course, My Little Scythe is more for kids. But even still, I played with a bunch of grown adults and we still enjoyed the game anyway. Nevertheless, what do you think about the game Scythe? What do you think about all of these games? I'm excited to try Pendulum because I haven't played that yet. And I've enjoyed all of these products so far and I'm going to expect the quality to be great. I'm going to expect the gameplay to be great. And I hope that it doesn't it doesn't crush me because none of these games have done so. Done so thus far. There, I said it right fully. <laughs> Nevertheless, go ahead and put down below what you think your thoughts are in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video, you can go ahead and like, comment, and subscribe. This is a bit rambly. It's just my thoughts on processing Scythe and the rest of these games. And I want to do something different to make you kind of weigh in what you think, because I really want to know what you think. It was more interesting playing this game with the people around me and hearing what they thought than even what my actual experience was, which I don't know if that's normal. Is that something that generally happens? Maybe it's just because I've been playing games so long or because of the type of game this is. Let me know what you think. Like, comment, subscribe, push the bell notification button. If you're interested, you can check out the website, unfilteredgamer.com. It's brand new. Tons of blog posts, articles are up. We have a giveaway for Shaolia, a bunch of cool stuff. And we're gonna have moderators on our Discord you can join. We're gonna have our Patreon, we have Patreon going up and we have our live stream every week, 6.30 p.m. where we play games just like this one, PST. And if you're interested in joining that community, Community, we'd be happy to have you. I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video and I hope you do check out our Kelly's Corner videos. They're very informative. And one just recently, the actual one I'm gonna talk about here just for a second is the Wingspan one, actually got in the BGG week uh, video of the week from their previous email send out, which I thought was really cool and really unique to see. I'm sure Kelly was very happy and probably not at all embarrassed that I'm saying this, but it's something I would strongly suggest you take a look at as well in comparison to this one. Tell me which one's better. I edited them both, but I think she sounds cuter and probably more intelligent than my ramblings. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. And as always, I look forward to rambling with you next time and maybe doing a review. I don't know.